Okay, let us talk about motion. We're going to be covering material from chapter one of our textbook, specifically in sections one, 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 two, one, three, one, four, and a teeny little bit of one, five, I'm pretty sure. Anyway, consider for a moment this individual here. Stunning, rugged, handsome, good looks, you know, he's got it all, including a nice mug full of cool, crisp, refreshing water. Now, if we were to say that this person was in motion, you know, how would we be able to describe this? Well, your textbook has it that they want to say motion is a change in an object's position relative to a given observer during a certain change in time. Without identifying the observer or frame of reference, it is impossible to say whether the object of interest moved. Physicists say motion is relative, meaning that the motion of any object of interest depends on the point of view of the observer. So, let's come back to this gentleman with his mug. The gentleman walks across the room with some velocity. So, you know, going from here to here. And because I'm lazy and don't want to redraw the mug, just gonna whoop, copy and paste that over there for me. Did the person move? Well, it's kind of hard to say, isn't it? We didn't specify an observer. So let's say that there is an Ellis girl over here judgmentally watching said individual with the mug in the water um, would she agree would she say that he moved well from her perspective his position changed he was here later on at a different time he's over there she would say he moved she he would she would say the mug moved the mug was here now it's there but if we consider this from a different perspective, the gentleman with the mug, as he looks at the mug in front of him, is the mug in motion. He sees it that the mug stays right in front of his face, more or less the whole time, still full of cool, crisp, refreshing water. Oh, water is so good from a mug. Um, so he might say, no, the mug stays in front of me, it is in front of me, it stays in front of me, the mug's not moving. So there can be a disagreement here, depending on your perspective. Now, we're going to put aside that for a second. We're going to usually take a static frame of reference, letting things move in front of it, and not worry too much about this idea of uh, changing reference frames and changing descriptions of motion. It's just good to keep in the back of your head that, you know, just because you don't necessarily agree on things doesn't mean that someone is wrong. Now, when it comes to representing this, we're going to want to use something called a motion diagram. This is a good way to get ourselves started. What I have here is a nice little axis, a couple positions marked out. And what I want to do is draw a dot to represent my object that's moving. And what I'm going to do, this dot is happening at some moment in time. I'm locating where it is and when it is. I can draw another dot later. I can draw another dot after that. And so, think for a second, what story is this telling? Hopefully you enjoyed that second of thinking about it. If you haven't, feel free to pause it, take another, take up to a minute, take, take a little while if you want. You don't, you don't have to take the literal second. I see someone here who is moving to the right as I've drawn it. You know, at one, at zero seconds, they're at the zero meter marker. At one second, they're at the two meter marker. And at four seconds, they're at the, or two seconds, they're at the four meter marker. I might further represent this person as having a velocity. I'm going to represent as this arrow and then label it with a V with an arrow to remind me that this velocity has a magnitude and a direction. It is what we call a vector quantity. So this arrow thing tells me that I'm looking at a vector, something that has magnitude, size, and direction. All right, so that's not too bad. What if I want to tell a slightly different story, though? What if instead this person started here, still again, the zero meter mark, was over here at the one meter mark, or at the one second mark, was over here at the two second mark, was over here at the three second mark? How are these stories different? If I look at my first case, my person is walking with a constant velocity. Every second, they go two meters. This time, though, I seem to have a large velocity initially, but then 
and it's a smaller velocity. In this next second, I'm only going to go one meter. The second after that, I'm only going to go a half a meter. Maybe I'm even going to go a smaller distance than this. So I want to represent, in addition to my velocity, a change in velocity. And so I can see between these first two intervals, my change in velocity, it's shrinking. It's going a little bit to the left. And then still shrinking a little bit here. Still shrinking a little bit here. I could go even further and make a change in change in velocity, but that's a little weird. Now you notice I'm saying change in, and I drew a triangle. This symbol is a delta, it's a Greek character, and when we see it, we want to think change in. We're going to come back to this later on, but a good way to think of what's happening is that if I started off with this was my velocity, and then I had this change in my velocity that made it smaller. This, what's left, is my new velocity. So this is old, this is new. And if I look at this, my old velocity plus my change in velocity is my new velocity. Or my change in velocity I should have my arrows on here, is my new velocity minus my old velocity. We're going to see this a lot more often whenever we see this delta, that it's new minus old, it's final minus initial. So look forward to seeing more and more of that. So this is a nice way to kind of organize our information graphically. But before we get too much further, we want to toss out some terminology that we're going to use. So some terms here, a position. So position is where you are with reference to a coordinate system or a reference frame. So coming back up here, my position at t equals one second is two meters to the right of whatever this point was. You know, maybe this is a classroom or a hallway or a road or who knows. And the idea is we're pulling out a lot of the details that we don't need so we can focus on the stuff that's relevant. Now, your displacement is your change in position. Notice what we got here, this change in again. So position we're often going to represent as x. Your displacement will then be delta x, the change in position. This is going to be a vector quantity. Both of these are. You care if you are two meters to the right of something or two meters to the left of something. Two meters to the right of something, you're inside a warm classroom. Safe, happy learning physics. Two meters to the left of something, you're hovering in midair about to fall into the parking lot. Something in this case being the window. So we care how far it is, the magnitude, and in what direction we're going. Now the distance of something, we're going to think is just the magnitude of your displacement. That's that two meters bit. If I'm two meters inside or two meters outside, that's a displacement. I'm two meters away from the window. Two meters is the distance I am away from the window. Then lastly, the path length. This is kind of weird. So let's say that I took this crazy path. I'm going to start here at some position x1. I'm going to wind up here at some position x2. Now. If I'm going to draw three different paths. One, uh, I'm going to try to draw mostly a straight line. That was mostly a straight line. Two, straight line that kind of zigzags a bit. And then three, a straight line that probably should have learned how to use its GPS. All of these lines have the same displacement because they all start at x1 and all end at x2. So their change in position is the same. They start at the same position, they end at the same position. Their path length, however, is very different because they took different paths to get there. So a lot of the times we don't care about the path length, but sometimes we do. We want to be able to, we want to have a terminology that allows us to say, well, not every path going between these two points are going to be the same. And path length is what helps us to get there. All right, now, one last thing to think about. We talked about making a motion 
motion diagram up here, yes? Now we want to talk about how to graph it. So if I take this, let's take a look at this story again. Different story this time. We seem to be starting at zero meters at zero seconds. After one second, we've gone two meters. After two seconds, we've gone four meters. After three seconds, we've gone six meters. This is a great way to organize it, but we want to be able to analyze it a little more than this. It doesn't, you know, some of the information isn't quite jumping out. So we want to be able to make a position time graph from this. So we have position on our x-axis. Sometimes this will be called a distance time graph. Position is what I'm going to usually use. And we have time in our, on our, or sorry, we have x on our y-axis and t on our y-x-axis. X on our vertical axis, position on our vertical axis, time on our horizontal axis. You want to get away from using x and y because, you know, we need to be able to be a little bit more flexible in things. So all I want to do is look up at these data points. I see at zero seconds, I'm at zero meters. At one second, I'm at two meters. At two seconds, I'm at four meters. At three seconds, I'm at six meters. So this is a nice little position versus time graph. If we look, all of these points appear to be falling pretty much on a line. And what we're going to be talking about eventually is what this line means. So something to think about, the slope of this line is of interest. It's going to be the rise, our change in x, there's all that change coming back, over our run. Hmm. If you know what that is already, and hopefully you do because you've taken a bit of physics at some point in middle school, you know, don't get ahead of the game here. We're going to get there in a second. Not literally a second because I'm still talking now that it's been several seconds later. But in a bit we will get there. Uh, specifically right now, this is the velocity. Specifically the average velocity. It's the velocity, this thing that we were talking about, up here. Right? We could see it from this motion diagram if we wanted. We see we're moving two meters every second. But when we look at a position time graph, we have the tools and the mathematical knowledge to really pull it right out. And so we might also want to represent, then, a velocity versus time graph. In this case, it's going to be pretty straightforward. It seems like at every moment, we're just going at two meters a second. So at some point, we're going to expand our ability to talk about fancier velocity time graphs, except for that one little bump there, I guess. But for now, we want to just be able to match all of these stories together. I see if I have a position time graph, I've got one slope, I have one velocity. So that means my velocity graph is flat. One velocity, specifically two meters per second. All right. So this should help you get through the beginning of this chapter. Again, we're talking about motion. This is stolen you know, wholesale from your textbook, although I put the frame of reference bit in. Remember that mugs are for drinking water. Motion diagrams help us kind of represent the motion that's happening and tell the story. They're not the most robust tools for analysis. We have a whole bunch of terminology talking about position and motion that we're going to start building up. Um, so you want to make sure you're clear about the difference between position, displacement, distance, and path length. And we want to be able to get towards graphing this so that we can bring some analytical tools to bear. So we want to look at position time graphs and velocity time graphs. Again, sections one, one, two, three, and four in your book. And right, let me know if you got questions.